Please welcome to the stage, Ricky Franco and David Hughes. Hello, my name is Ricky Franco, and I'm the Community Service Director here at Hands of Hope. And we're so excited to have you guys join us tonight. Good evening, my name is David Hughes. I'm the Prevention Services Manager. And uh, just uh, if you just got your food, we want to let you know, go ahead and keep eating. We're just getting started so we can keep the night on track and get you guys out of here on time. Um, but I did want to mention that since Mr. Tabor retired, uh, Ricky and I make up every Y chromosome currently employed at Hands of Hope. <laughs> Which I'm happy to report is a 100% increase from last year. So that's good. It's a good thing. So on a more serious note, um, as a husband and father of three, and as a husband and father of eight, yeah, <laughs> we are and represent pro-life men that take seriously the responsibility to value women and children as fellow image bearers of Christ. God has done some incredible things here at Hands of Hope this year, and it is largely uh, due to people like you in this room and people that are in this room. Um, so on behalf of our entire organization, I'd like to thank everyone who has given of your time, your talent, and your treasure to help drive our mission forward as ministry partners. We're so blessed to have sponsors such as Intelligent Design, and the others that you'll see on the screens that have come alongside of Hands of Hope and this event as our title sponsors, our event sponsors, and our ministry sponsors. Hands of Hope envisions a culture where all human life is considered valuable, precious, and worthy of protection from conception to natural death or, as our executive director, Elisa, likes to put it, from womb to tomb. Hands of Hope is a Christ-centered organization promoting a culture of life, hope, and healing. Now, this is accomplished by caring for those facing an unplanned pregnancy, revealing truth about the unborn person, teaching sexual integrity, and offering a path to healing from an abortion experience. We believe God's people are at their best when they respond with compassion toward those who are vulnerable, voiceless, and misled. We also believe in the midst of an issue as politicized as abortion, we must be present with the people that are being impacted and love them. We believe Hands of Hope is a unique, has a unique role in the pro-life movement in Pima County because of our holistic approach. An approach that shapes our mission and our ministry pillars. Those pillars are prevention, intervention, and restoration. Our prevention programs seek to reduce the amount of abortions by helping teens avoid unplanned pregnancies by making healthy choices. We, also, we will also begin equipping parents and guardians to engage in conversations about sex, love, and relationships at home where most in the, of the influence over teens still resides. In intervention, our pregnancy center allows us to serve women facing unplanned pregnancies with free services that include pregnancy testing and ultrasounds. By extending grace and hope into their situation, clients are able to make a decision for life. Our restoration services offer a variety of ways for men and women uh, to begin a journey of, it, of healing from an abortion experience pregnancy loss, or early infant loss. We would like everyone to know whether before, during, or after an unplanned pregnancy, we care and we are a resource to this community. In each of our pillars, we diligently work so that we can confidently say, we meet people at their point of need so that we might have the privilege of sharing the love of Jesus with them. Now, I've had the honor to join the team as a community services director this year and to be a part of this wonderful, life-giving work that is Hands of Hope. Now, most of you are very familiar with our pregnancy centers, which we refer to as our intervention pillar. 
We call it the intervention because we have the privilege to intervene at a crucial time in a woman's decision-making process. This year, we're able to serve 1,070 individual clients. Now, of those clients, 87% of those clients who had an ultrasound at Hands of Hope made a decision to continue their pregnancy. Now, we wanted to take a moment and share with you a representation of the babies that were saved at our pregnancy center this year. Mm. Now, the intervention pillar is at the heart of Hands of Hope. But today, we'd also like to share with you the great work that's happening to bring hope, life, and healing to this community and the other two pillars that completes our holistic approach. I have the privilege of managing our prevention pillar. Uh, my greatest joy in doing this is playing a small part in the spiritual development of the people that I work with. Um, it's very fulfilling to see a group of teens and young adults, there they are, passionate about impacting their peers for the kingdom. Uh, here's some compelling information that we've gathered from our assembly program. Of the students we have surveyed, 62.8% state we have changed their opinion about sex. <laughs> Nearly 80% state that we have changed their opinion about the value of their lives. And 92% of students state they want to fight for their future by making healthy choices. <laughs> Praise God. This last year, we were fortunate enough to serve 3,443 students across Puma County in our schools and churches. Our restoration pillar has been faithfully served for the last few years by Lori Navrodsky and her amazing team of volunteers. Through programs such as the retreats, support groups, and individual counseling, the restoration team has brought healing to men and women in our community and churches that have had an abortion. Our recent Deeper Still retreat allows men and women to grieve and heal from an abortion experience. During our recent retreats, 37 babies have been acknowledged, mourned, honored, memorialized, and named by their moms and dads. We desire through these programs to bring healing and restoration to those that have similar experiences. It's always encouraging to reflect back on what God has done over the last year. We're also excited to share some new initiatives uh, that will be coming in the starting season. In finding more ways to reach our community and those that need healing from an abortion experience, our restoration pillar has begun a relationship with the Pima County Jail and will begin to offer resources to the chaplains and inmates. Prevention is in the preliminary stages of rolling out an exciting new program um, uh, for guardians and parents in our community that's called The Whole Sex Talk. Mm -hmm. So this is a six-week six workshop for parents that equips them to talk to their children about sex, love, and relationships. Please take a look. So I had this conversation with my son last night, and I said, you know, Josh, I don't remember us having conversation about sex. Do you remember if we did? And he said, well, yeah, Dad, I remember. And I remember how incredibly awkward that conversation was. My responsibility as a father is to provide for my kids, to prepare them for life and to protect them from harm. That's the best protection you can give your child 
is that, that, that open door policy where they can talk to you. Conversation is the protection for your children. I think the best way that my parents showed affection to me was just always being open to conversation, regardless of what it was about. If I were a parent, I would definitely say, reach out every now and then. Of course, don't be overbearing, because we do want to be alone sometimes, but we don't want to feel alone. I participated in over five abortions. They don't tell you that you'll walk up down the street sometime and you look up in the air in the sky and you wonder what your kids look like. I couldn't believe that, that someone like me could have a second chance, but with God, you can. You know, I tell parents, never give up on your kids. I wouldn't be here today without the power of praying parents. Parents are essential. It's relationship that changes behavior. Let them know your love is there and it's solid. What I want parents to know, and what their kids need to know, is that you love them in a way that no one else ever has. And you are still, even when it doesn't feel like it, you are still their greatest influence. Oh, isn't it so important to open up those conversations? And, and that is uh, our desire as we knowing, knowing that we need this as a component to our prevention pillar, being able to provide resources for families. Now, through these three pillars, Hands of Hope continues to find ways to partner with our community and you to minister and bring hope to men, women, and families. If you'd like to be a part of what we're doing here at Hands of Hope, please visit one of the ministry tables out in the lobby and see how you can get involved. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your program. Please welcome Sarah Cameron, Cindy Buller, and Lori Navrotsky. Hi, my name is Sarah Cameron, and I have had the honor of working at Hands of Hope for the last six years. I started at our pregnancy center for the first three years and have had the opportunity to work in our prevention pillar with our incredible teenage um, and college age students for the last three years. Over and over, both in my personal life and in my time at Hands of Hope, I have um, realized the, the power of prayer. In 2 Chronicles, it says, If my people who are called by name, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Prayer is something that we've really intentionally cultivated in our breakdown team over the last few years, and I have literally watched our culture shift because of it. Anyone who at some point in their life was a teenager knows the struggles of those years. And we know that the enemy has been trying to steal, kill, and destroy since the beginning of time. And we've learned that that's no different with our breakdown team members. But um, one thing that is really unique about our breakdown team is that it's students ministering to students which makes it a really effective message. But because of that, um, God has really opened our eyes to the fact that we, um, in order to be the most effective that we can be, have to help our student volunteers understand that our mission is only, um, or is largely accomplished through prayer. One of the most exciting things for me this year has been to match up each one of our team members um, with a prayer partner that has committed for the entire school year to, pay, to pray specifically for all 34 of our team members. So it's somebody from outside of their immediate circle committed to lifting them up and covering them in prayer as they do this mission. 
If you come to a breakdown at rehearsal, you will see our volunteers praying over each one of the, the chairs in a school auditorium. You will see our students praying for each other and interceding on behalf of the students that will hear our message. In my time on the team, I have watched God answer really tangible prayers. I have watched our teenagers be moved to pray in the middle of a public school auditorium with another student. And I have witnessed God bless our ministry because we have made prayer more of a priority. Within the prevention pillar, it's really hard to quantify our results. Um, in our pregnancy centers, we can track when a baby is saved. But with our program, we may never know the full impact that we have on this side of eternity. But what we have come to realize is that if we focus more on our mountain moving God, then we can be assured that this message is not going to return void. I'm excited to tell you that um, we are entirely booked for our 2018-2019 school year. And from the beginning of the school year in August until May, we're projected to impact over 8,000 students. We really believe that God is opening doors because we have um, been more intentional about equipping our team members with what they need to walk into the battlefield. So if you have not seen one of our performances, we would love to have you join us in an upcoming show. You can visit our website at breakdowntucson.com and see the list of schools we'll be performing at. Um, I really believe that there is very few things more encouraging in this day and age than watching teenagers stand for truth. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Cindy Buller, and I am the Client Services Director of our Pregnancy Center. One of the goals of Hands of Hope is to partner with the local church so that together we can be prepared to come alongside women and families facing unplanned pregnancy. This is something that we've been praying for for many years. This story is about a client who came to Hands of Hope through her local church. The recent loss of her father, and at the time a very unsupportive boyfriend, made for a very uncertain future for Rhiannon. Thankfully, her pastor knew just what to do when she came to his doorstep, when she showed up at his doorstep. Our focus is to meet people at their point of need so that we might have the privilege of sharing the love of Christ with them. Our hope for all of our clients is that they will receive the love, care, and support they need to make a courageous decision for life. But their story can't end there. Our clients need discipleship through the local church. In order to move forward, Rihanna needed the assurance of a support system that would surround her both during and after her pregnancy. Hands of Hope Tucson was there during the critical time while Rihanna was making her decision. Her pastor and church community were there to surround her with the spiritual support she needed. It is this very circle of care that gave Rhiannon and her family the opportunity to thrive after an unplanned pregnancy. This past August, I had the privilege of joining Rhiannon at her church as she dedicated her beautiful baby girl to the Lord. What a blessing to know that what happened in Rhiannon's story started and continues in partnership between Hands of Hope and the local church. Today, we celebrate this young woman's courage to keep going despite all odds. Good evening. My name is Lori Navratsky. At Hands of Hope, we understand that many women and men regret their abortion decisions. Sometimes it's right away, and often it's years later. 
As Recovery Services Manager, I have the privilege of coming alongside them as they seek both spiritual and emotional healing. When Cynthia came to us for a pregnancy test, she was considering abortion. During our time together, she also talked about ongoing struggles with past abortions. We were able to meet her with love and compassion in her current situation, as well as giving her a place to sort through the memories and emotions associated with these past experiences. I'm happy to tell you that Cynthia decided to continue her pregnancy, and she also joined us for our weekend abortion recovery retreat while she was 12 weeks pregnant. Cynthia was nervous when she first arrived, but her heart was open and God met her where she needed him most. She had a hard time that God could really forgive her, but her prayer partner helped her see that God loved her just as she was and that Jesus' sacrifice was enough for every sin, even the sin of abortion. She asked Jesus to be Lord of her life and she rejoined um, the group for lunch. It was really obvious that something had changed. She was so excited to share with everyone about her decision. The retreat gave Cynthia a safe and loving place to finally grieve and name her four babies lost to abortion and to surrender to God other painful areas of her past. Her prayer partner talked with her about baptism and by the last day, she wanted to be baptized. Fortunately, God blessed us with a warm hot tub on the property and Christy had the opportunity to baptize her. This past summer, Christy, or Cynthia gave birth to a precious baby girl. We recognize that she's at the beginning of her spiritual journey, but we also know that with the Holy Spirit, she can be victorious. We've known each other since uh, middle school, sixth grade. It was in high school when we started our relationship. Well, I was 19 when I got pregnant, and I also lived on my own. I had moved out of my mom's house when I was 16. She was uh, struggling with a uh, drug addiction, so uh, my sisters got adopted, and it broke my heart. So, um, I wanted a baby. <laughs> and um, we had Rosalie. <laughs> we were happy, but we were struggling for years, for like the whole time we were together. It was just like paycheck to paycheck. And then when we broke up, it was mainly because of financial reasons. We kept fighting, so we were, we weren't together for those eight months. And for a while, I was really um, depressed. You know, I didn't know what to do. And then around the holidays, that's when Sergio came back around, and he wanted to fix things because he missed Rosalie, and so we started breaking things out. And then that's when, a year later, I got pregnant again. I immediately just started crying because I wasn't ready to have a baby and I was just scared. I actually did a Google search. I wanted to look up uh, help or abortion options and Hands of Hope was one of the first ones that popped up. So I decided to come here. Well, when I first got here, I was just nervous because I didn't know what I was going to do yet. And I didn't know how it was going to be. I was just, the unknown was scaring me. <laughs> what helped me a lot was Nancy. Nancy is um, one of the people from Hands of Hope. Uh, she was there to kind of talk to me the first day that I went about, you know, what was going on. and why I felt like I need, I couldn't do it. And then after finding out how far I was and everything, I, you know, automatically found out that I only have so much time. And um, then I found um, the abortion clinic and scheduled an appointment there. I had told her, you know, I wanted the baby, 
but if she really, you know, wanted to go through with it and everything, you know, I was going to support her and I was going to be there with her through it all. When we went to the abortion clinic, it was pretty, pretty hard because, you know, it was, you know, we're taking away a life, you know, before, you know, even letting it make its own decisions and... I knew it wasn't right, even though I felt like I needed to do it, I just knew that I couldn't. For a while, I, it was, I was just numb, but then the day of the abortion, God just like was right there. The day that it came, I couldn't get up from bed. I didn't want to get up. <laughs> it was hard, so we didn't go. <laughs> well, after we decided to keep the baby, I was excited to tell Nancy the news at Hands of Hope, and she called me before I could call her. <laughs> And she asked me, you know, how's everything going? And and I told her, I was like, I'm keeping him. I was happy to, you know, plan the baby shower. I was happy to buy baby clothes. We didn't have anything in the house to make it look like we were having a baby at all. But the last month we had everything. But I know Hands of Hope was a big influence to us, you know. They made me feel safe, like there was another option. and There was a whole, a whole group of people behind us. Yeah, after he was born, uh, we were excited to come into Hands of Hope, and I wanted to show Ezra off to Nancy, and I wanted her to meet Rosalie and Sergio, just the whole family, and how happy we were, and how happy I was to be able to, to be blessed enough to have these people behind me. He's happy too. <laughs> Stephanie Gray is an international speaker from Canada. She is also the author of Love Unleashes Life, Abortion and the Art of Communicating Truth, as well as A Physician's Guide to Discussing Abortion. She began presenting at the age of 18 and has given over 800 pro-life presentations. Stephanie was a recent presenter for the series Talks at Google, speaking on abortion at Google headquarters. Stephanie likes to say that if she weren't fighting abortion, she would be Mary Poppins in the Daily Parade at Disneyland. Or she'd be a music therapist, or both. Stephanie loves, loves, loves to play her ukulele, which she has named Joy. In a world of much darkness, we could all use a little more joy. So on that note, no pun intended, please welcome Stephanie Gray. Testing one, two, three, lovely. Okay, as much as I love to sing and play my ukulele, there was no room for joy on my carry-on. So instead, I'm going to tell you about another one of my loves, which is quotes. I love quotes. And shortly before I gave my presentation at Google headquarters, in preparation, I read a short little booklet called On the Christian Meaning of Human Suffering. And in that book was the following quote. Suffering unleashes love. Suffering unleashes love. How true is that? When do we step outside of ourselves? When do we serve another? Isn't it when we see them in need in some way? Suffering, vulnerable, and it's that which unleashes love from us. Suffering unleashes love. Those words were brought to life for me very personally about 10 years ago when I traveled with my mom to Romania. And my mom and I went there to work at a failure to thrive clinic, a clinic for children with the condition failure to thrive. Some of them were orphaned, some were not, but all of them needed 
human interaction, more than just food, clothing, and shelter. They needed connection. There was profound suffering there. One little girl in particular stands out in my memory. I'll call her Maria. My mom was assigned to primarily care for Maria, and Maria had been in isolation just prior to our arrival at the clinic and was released when we got there and was assigned to be cared for by my mom. Maria was six months old, and she weighed only six pounds. She had fetal alcohol syndrome, drippy eyes that never seemed to stop dripping, a very large bed sore on her bottom, and she was entirely lifeless and emotionless. If you tickled her, stroking her cheek or her neck, she made not even a flinch. She did not cry. And at the times she sneezed, you only knew she sneezed if you happened to be looking at her and see the movement. Lifeless, suffering. And yet, when my mom got there, she began to hold this little girl that had been in isolation. And she rocked her. And she sang to her. She unleashed love on her. And all of a sudden, within about a week, when you started to stroke her cheek, she smiled. She started to cry and make noise because she knew someone would respond. Not only as I saw my mom interact with this little girl did I see the words, suffering unleashes love, come to life. But the rest of what I believe should follow that quote were seen up close and personally by me, and that is that love unleashes life. The suffering of this child drew out of my mom this willing of her good, a leading to this child's human flourishing. And that love unleashed new life in this little girl a new spirit. In our own backyard, there is profound suffering. The suffering of women in crisis, feeling abandoned, alone, perhaps in poverty, perhaps conceived as a result of sexual assault. There are the million children killed every year by abortion, denied personhood status. Of the tens of millions that have been killed by abortion, or had abortions, or experienced the crisis of an unplanned pregnancy since abortion became legal in America, we can rightly look at that and say, there is profound suffering in our midst. And we are here tonight because we believe the presence of that suffering is meant to unleash our love, to will the good of the preborn child, and to will the good of the mother and anyone else around her who is in crisis. And when we unleash love on these individuals, it both figuratively and literally can unleash life, lifting the spirits of those in crisis and protecting the lives of those in danger of abortion. What I want to do this evening is reflect on this idea, suffering unleashing love, love unleashing life, and in particular, I want to reflect on three related thoughts to this idea that suffering unleashes love and love unleashes life. I want to talk about the importance of prayer in our effort to love people so as to save lives. The second thing I want to reflect on is how we cannot have love without truth and how we can best communicate truth in a loving way. And the final thing I want to address is how the witness of another person's love can inspire people to make the right choice. In terms of prayer, I've heard it said many times, you become who you spend time with. You become who you spend time with. If we want to be loving, we need to prioritize time with love itself, with God Almighty. One of my former spiritual directors had recommended to me years ago that I read a book called The Soul of the Apostolate. The Soul of the Apostolate. And in this book, it talks about how when you're involved in apostolic work, in ministry-based activity, there can be this tendency to focus on the scripture passage. The harvest is plentiful, but what? The laborers are few, right? And then you know what happens? We often make up the rest of that passage. 
We think it goes, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so get on out into the harvest and do all the labor the other laborers aren't around for. That's not how that passage ends. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, so what? Pray. Pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest will send more laborers into his harvest. Prayer is the soul of the apostolate. And if we get so busy doing, taking on other people's jobs, two dangerous things happen. One, there's no longer the void for the person who's supposed to fill it to notice because we're filling it for them. Number two, because we filled it, we've become too busy and we start to cut back on prayer. There's a beautiful image in this book. St. Bernard had come up with it, that we're to be reservoirs and not channels. Reservoirs, not channels. If you think about the channel, that body of water, it just flows through. That's like the busy soul going, going, doing, doing, never taking time to pray. Reservoir is very different. A reservoir fills up and the excess overflows. That is what we're to be like. And if we want to love others, then we need to take time to be still and know that God is God allow ourselves to be filled up with love itself and allow that to overflow into our encounters. I love taking passages of the scriptures and turning them into meditative prayers. One in particular is part of what I consider the most pro-life passage in the scriptures. And that's in Luke chapter 1, when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and tells her she will conceive God himself. And Mary is told that her cousin Elizabeth has also conceived. And so she goes to visit Elizabeth, and when Mary enters Elizabeth's home, the scriptures tell us that John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb for joy. Now, a lot of people think that that's the pro-life passage I'm referring to, but it's actually not that. It's not John the Baptist, the late-term fetus leaping for joy, that I think is the most pro-life part of the scriptures. It's why John the Baptist leapt for joy. He leapt for joy because when Mary entered Elizabeth's home, she didn't enter alone. She was a walking tabernacle, bearing God Almighty in human form in her womb. And John the Baptist, the late-term fetus, recognized Jesus Christ, the first trimester embryo, and he leaps for joy in the presence of the tiny human Christ child. Elizabeth says, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And what does Mary say? My soul magnifies the Lord. That should be our prayer in every encounter we have. May my soul magnify the Lord. We're all built of good bits and bad bits. We've got virtue, we've got vice, but we're all image bearers. And when you magnify something, you don't change what it looks like. You change where you look. You zoom in on one particular part. And that ought to be the prayer of our heart in every encounter we have. May I magnify the Lord. May I zoom in on the image of God in me. May I zoom in on love to bear that love to another. Prayer must be the soul of our apostolate. The second thing I want to reflect on is how we cannot have love without truth. And so as we love others, that means we're going to come communicate truths to them that will set them free, but might be kind of difficult to accept in the short term. So it's so important to realize that although you cannot have love without truth, it's very important how we communicate that truth. And if we want to know how to communicate truth to others, we need to look to the example of Jesus. Time and again throughout the scriptures, as he interacts with people, we see Jesus asking questions, and we see Jesus telling stories. And throughout my pro-life career, as I have engaged the culture formally in presentations and debates, informally in conversations, time and again I've asked questions and told stories. And I want to give you some examples of how I've done that so you can do the same. When I have to convince people that the preborn child is human starting at the moment of fertilization. 
I have found just as parables have been useful, it's helpful to have a little parable to help people grasp the concept that the one-celled embryo that looks nothing like what we look like is nonetheless unrepeatable and irreplaceable just like you and me at that one cell stage. How do we do that? Well, the story I like to tell involves an old technology that's making a comeback. We often see it at wedding receptions. They'll be placed on tables where the bride and groom will tell their guests, please use this Polaroid camera to take photos of your experience of our wedding reception. And I like to say to audiences, imagine that you have a Polaroid camera, but instead of being at a wedding reception, you're on holiday. And you're going to take pictures with this camera because you want printouts because, you know, who prints photos off their phones anymore, right? So you take your Polaroid camera on vacation and you go to where my dad is from. Although I'm from Canada, my dad is not. Okay, right, my dad's from Scotland. He's got a great Scottish accent. So um, let's imagine you go on vacation to Scotland. And um, while you're in Scotland, you go to a very, very famous place. Right, it's called Loch Ness. Now what's in Loch Ness? The monster, right? So let's imagine you're on a boat tour of Loch Ness and you're taking photos with your Polaroid camera. Now let's say a couple hours into your boat tour, when you look over your shoulder, you suddenly see the Loch Ness Monster. All those humps and bumps are sticking out of the water. So you point your Polaroid in that direction and you snap a photo and that little card comes out. Now, just as the card comes out where you see that black, brown, smudgy stuff and you begin to shake it, just as all that's happening, Nessie goes underwater. I often like to ask people, having told that little story, this question, I'll say, would you be disappointed the Loch Ness Monster has disappeared? And sometimes people say, well, yeah. And I'll say, okay, well, what will console you in your frustration? And they'll say, well, the picture. And I'll say, exactly. And, and you're shaking this photo thinking, this is, this is gold. This is not for my photo album. I'm going to sell this to newspapers and magazines. I'm going to make a whole lot of money and pay off a whole lot of debt. So you're really excited about the value of this photo. As you're shaking it, someone on the boat tour with you who's never seen this technology excitedly grabs the card and has a look. But when they first look at the card, what they see are those brown black smudges and they think the photo didn't take properly. So with great disappointment, they rip it and toss it in the lake. Would you be upset? Okay, right, we Scottish people are known for having a wee bit of a temper. Right, so let's imagine Braveheart comes out and you get angry at this person for destroying your photo and they look at you like you're crazy. And they say, yeah, it was just black brown smudges. Why do you care so much about black brown smudges? And you'd likely reply, it wasn't just black brown smudges. Everything about the image of the Loch Ness Monster was captured in an instant. It just needed time to develop. And that story helps make it clear that when you have sperm egg fusion, you have the moment of fertilization, the one-celled embryo, everything about who each of us is today was captured in that instant. We just needed time to develop. When we want to communicate truth in love, we want to ask questions, we want to tell stories. I remember debating a philosophy professor who once argued that abortion was justified even if the embryo was a human at fertilization. Because humans who have human rights may not use another human who has a human right, may not use their body without their consent. He said, if you have a child who's dying of kidney disease, it would be nice of you to donate one of your kidneys to your child. But the law shouldn't force you, even though your child is a living human person. They don't have a right to your kidney. And just as your child doesn't have a right to your kidney, your child doesn't have a right to your uterus. What do we say? Well, I didn't know what to say in that context, but as a person of faith, I began to pray. And so I looked calm, cool, and collected externally, kind of dying inside. And so I called on the Holy Spirit, and I actually sensed God talk to me. It's not that I heard him audibly, but he did distinctly say the following. Stephanie, I made the uterus for a different purpose. Now, that's all God gave me, but uh, he knows what we need, and so I just kept repeating that over like a mantra in my mind. Okay, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? And then it was my turn to get up, and it was the moment of epiphany. 
And I got up in front of these 200 students. I said, Professor Snedden makes a very compelling argument until we ask ourselves a question. And the question we have to ask ourselves is this. What is the nature and purpose of the kidney versus the nature and purpose of the uterus? Because when we ask and answer that question, we come to see why the parent is not obligated to give the kidney, but should be obligated to give the uterus. I said the kidney exists in my body, for my body. The uterus is very different, I said. The uterus exists in my body, but every single month, it's getting ready for someone else's body. I can live without my uterus, but my offspring cannot. It's an organ unique from all my others in that it exists more for my offspring than for me, and they can therefore claim a right to it in a way a child couldn't claim a right to a kidney. A few days later, the professor told his class he was up all night trying to think of a response. So I like to say that that reinforces the power of questions, but primarily the power of prayer. Prayer helps us see how we can best communicate to others. Another passage from the scriptures I like to pray is that when the blind man called out to Jesus and said, Lord, that I may see. And how that can also be the prayer of our heart. Lord, that I may see what this person needs to hear. Lord, that I may see how to best reach them. And I had an experience like that a few years ago when a student came to the microphone and asked during Q&A, what about rape? My typical response is quite short. I'll say, I agree with you. Rape is a horrible injustice. And I agree with you, we need to give special support and counseling and care to victims of sexual assault. We need more serious consequences for the rapists themselves. I do have to ask myself a question. And the question I ask myself is this, is it fair to give the death penalty to the innocent child? I've had some people react by saying, I never thought of it that way. Not this girl. She's like, yeah, but. So I thought, okay, maybe a question's not enough. Maybe she needs a story. And so I said, okay, imagine this. I said, imagine you have a woman who has consensual sex on a Monday with her husband, and the following day she's raped by a stranger walking home at night. In one month's time, when she takes a pregnancy test and sees that it's positive, she doesn't know, staring at that test, whether the father of her child is the husband or the rapist. So I said, let's say she hopes it's her husband's child, she carries through with the pregnancy, and after the baby is born, they do a paternity test. Test results come back and reveal the child's father, not her husband. It's the rapist. I ended my story with a question. Would we allow that woman or anyone to kill the newborn child because of the father's crime? She said, no. I said, okay. Why would we allow that woman or anyone to kill the preborn child because of the father's crime? She said, yeah, but that would never happen. I mean, you made that up. That's unrealistic. So I thought, oh, I have more. So I said, that was the internal dialogue. So I said, okay. I said, you know, a few years ago, I was reading an article in the New York Times. It was an interview with an abortionist by the name of Dr. Wickland. And at one point in the article, it said, Dr. Wickland described her horror when she aborted the pregnancy of a woman who had been raped only to discover after examining the removed tissue, where the doctor has to make sure all the body parts are out so that the woman doesn't hemorrhage. As she was examining the removed tissue, she realized the pregnancy was further along than she or the woman had thought. And in that moment, she realized she had just aborted an embryo the woman and her husband had conceived together. Even the abortionist was horrified. Having now told a real story, I asked a question. If it's horrifying to kill a child conceived in love, isn't it horrifying to kill a child conceived in violence? Because the common denominator is that in both cases, we're dealing with a child. She said, yeah, but... I thought, nothing's getting through to her. 
There was a long line of questioners behind her, and so I said I'd have to take their questions, but I would happily speak with her one-on-one -on -one at the end. Sure enough, when the event was over, she came to the podium to speak further about the topic. And as none of my logic, my questions, my analogies were getting through to her, I began to wonder, maybe the problem's not here. Maybe the problem's here. Could I be speaking to a victim of sexual assault? Or someone who's close to someone who's been hurt in that way? And could that have caused her to build up an emotional wall, preventing reason from getting through? And so I changed the direction of my conversation with her. I said, I said, you know, I have a friend who was molested as a child. I'm one of about five people who know this. My friend to this day has never told her parents. And I said, when she was triggered with memories at a certain time of life and she disclosed what happened to a few of us, I realized I was a friend but not a counselor. And so I encouraged her to get professional help. I went with her to one of her counseling sessions to be a support. And I said, I'll be honest, my friend never got pregnant. She was too young. But I said, I bring this up because in journeying with her to get help, what became very clear to me is that when someone has been sexually assaulted, whether they get pregnant and have an abortion or not, they've been traumatized by the sexual assault, and abortion won't take that trauma away. And this look of sadness washed over the girl's face, and she said, yeah, 10 years and counting. And I said, I am so sorry for your suffering. In that moment, I set aside all my logic, my apologetics, and I met her where she was at in her story and in her pain. I asked her different questions like, how are you doing? Do you feel safe? Is the person who hurt you still in your life? Do you feel you received adequate counseling? Could I help connect you to a place where you could get more help? And I saw her transform before my eyes from the hostile, frustrated, angry girl at the microphone to a peaceful, reflective individual in front of me where a bridge had been built. I was reminded of something my friends at Justice for All have said. When someone asks about rape, they're not asking if the baby's human. They're asking if the pro-lifer is human. Do we care as much for the person in front of us as we rightly care for the child in the womb? And is that evident in how we look at, speak to, and interact with the person before us? We need to pray. We need to communicate truth in love. And we need to have the witness of another person's love to inspire others to make the right choice. If we think about what love is, Thomas Aquinas said that to love is to will the other's good. To love is to will the other's good. And there are so many inspiring examples of people who face difficulties and hardships and risks to themselves, but put the other's good ahead of themselves. And there's something magnetic about those examples that draw us in and make us want to be like those people. And those are the stories we need to share. We as a pro-life movement have to tell better stories than the abortion advocates tell. We're not against choice. We're in favor of the right choice. And to draw people to the right choice, we want to tell these better stories. One of the stories I like to tell is about the Captain Chesley Sullenberger who had been flying that US Airways flight almost a decade ago needing to make an emergency landing because my country got in the way. Yeah, our Canadian geese. Unfortunately, a large flock of them decided to take the same flight pattern as this plane, got sucked into the engines, both engines die, and the plane needs to land. And Captain Sullenberger knew he didn't have time to get back to LaGuardia or any of the other airports, so he thought, I'm going to have to make a water landing. And as we know, he safely landed that flight on the Hudson River. Everyone at the back of the plane is getting away from the back because water started to get in through the back door. Water is filling the cabin and people are spilling out out the middle doors, out the front doors, on the wings. And as everyone's getting off, one person's staying on. That was Captain Sullenberger. And as everyone was escaping the back, one person was walking towards it. That was Captain Sullenberger. And as water was filling the cabin up to waist level, he walked that aisle not just once but twice. 
to make sure no one was left on the plane. And when he was sure everyone was off, then he was the last to get off. We celebrate him as a hero. Why? Because he willed the others good. He put others ahead of himself. And that's ultimately what we're challenging those in crisis to do. The difficult thing, the right thing, to put the other ahead of the self. I met a student a few years ago. She told me when she was 16, she got pregnant. And I said, how did your family react? She said, my dad disowned me. I said, what about others in your family? She says, I have five brothers. They stopped speaking to me. I said, what about your mom? She said, oh, she's been dead since I was two. And I looked at her and I thought, how did you do it? How did you carry through with this pregnancy? Because she told me that she, here she was in college parenting a toddler. And to quote her directly, she said, I seeked help. She went to a pregnancy center, much like yours. And she was helped by a couple who had a home for pregnant women. They invited her under their roof. And her suffering unleashed their love. And receiving that love gave that girl permission to unleash life. I'm reminded also of a student named Veronica, also got pregnant in college. I met her a few years ago. And she told me that when she got pregnant, her friends who had abortions wanted her to have one. Her boyfriend, who was initially supportive, was no longer supportive. She told me she called her parents and told them she was pregnant. And they said, come back home. We want you to move back in. We will help you. Her suffering unleashed their love. And that gave her permission to unleash the life of Amelia. She told me a story about caring for her daughter, Amelia, and said, she became very ill with respiratory problems around seven months, which meant a lot of nights of dealing with fevers, congestion, pain control, and a sad little baby who kept waking up due to having trouble breathing in her sleep. She said, one night I decided to let her sleep on my chest instead of in her crib, and she slept through the whole night. She said, I did that every night until she got better. She said, to me, it represents what we do as mothers, that we stop looking at ourselves as individuals, and we begin to look at how we can serve another, and therefore love another, and in doing that comes learning to love ourselves. Suffering unleashes love, and love unleashes life. If we think about it, that message is embodied not just in the story of Veronica to her daughter and her parents. It's embodied not just in the story of Nadej, that girl at 16 who had the support of those strangers and carried her pregnancy to term. It's not just embodied in the story of Captain Sullenberger, nor is it just embodied in the story of my mom in response to little Maria in Romania. Suffering unleashes love, love unleashes life is the gospel story. Because we humans who were created not just good, but very good, didn't trust God. We betrayed our creator. Adam and Eve sinned, and that cut us off. Mankind was now suffering. But what do the scriptures tell us? For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever might believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Our suffering, being separated from God, unleashed God's love through his son, Jesus Christ, who gave us eternal life. That's the story of the gospel. And as pro-lifers, we take up our cross and we follow Christ. And we let that be the story of the pro-life movement. That in the face of people suffering, like Christ, we will unleash love so as to figuratively and literally unleash life. God bless you. Three years ago, the Lord had me um, come to the Tucson Medical Park Plaza. My dermatologist was practicing at the time in the, in the same area. And that particular day, I was in my car observing a couple 
that was standing in front of the abortion clinic. And you could tell just by their body language, she was crying, he was um, really concerned that they just were not sure if they should go into the abortion clinic or not. Did they know that Hands of Hope existed? Did they know about our free medical services? What were their practical needs? What resources were they lacking? Did they know about all of their options? And I just prayed for them. If our pregnancy center had been here, could we have helped that couple? And what would it mean if we could actually be that close to the very clients that we are called to minister to? And that idea quickly turned into a major prayer request. And so we are sitting in an answered prayer. Being in a medical plaza really, I think, ups our credibility and makes us more professional in every way. We have physicians here to help, we'll have nurses here to help, we'll, have, we'll provide ultrasound and pregnancy testing here, and it will be a place where um, we'll love them no matter what their decision is. So we have the building. We don't have to raise any funding for the building itself, but we want to prepare the space. We want this space to be top-notch, grade-A, beautiful, professional, and that's gonna take some work. We definitely have some construction that needs to be done, some remodeling, and so I don't know if that's so much a challenge, but it is a real need that we have. This is about transforming hearts, which transform decisions, which transform families, which transform generations to come. This is so close to God's heart. It's about God's people, it's about God's kingdom, and it's about how he wants to bring his kingdom to Tucson and to the Tucson Medical Park Plaza. When you pray for humility, you trip on the step on your way up. What an incredible year we've had. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this ministry that is going to bring light, love, and life to the Tucson Medical Park Plaza, next to Planned Parenthood, the last remaining abortion clinic in Pima County. I know we're running late. I'm going to try to try to make a stay on time, but I need to thank my team. I want to start by saying our staff and volunteers are amazing. I could not ask for a more unified, compassionate, mission-driven group of people to co-labor with. My board of directors, Joni, Lacey, Jeff, Jill, Jonathan, and Mary, who are my constant source of encouragement. Thank you. To my advisory board, Dick, Brad, Doug, Tom, and Jim, thank you for your wisdom, for your generosity, and your godly counsel this year. I sure needed it. And of course, to John Tabor, who's here with us tonight, who still thought that it was a good idea for me to step into his big shoes. John, I love you so much. Together, you have made this dream a reality. I would love to share all of the details surrounding this amazing opportunity, but seriously, I don't have time, and I'm actually considering writing a book <laughs> about how this whole process went because I stand before you amazed. I'm absolutely amazed. As you heard me say in the video, um, we have been praying about this strategic location for years, and not just us at Hands of Hope. When we started sharing the news with people, we knew that there were prayer warriors all over our city who had been praying that God would have his way in that medical park plaza. Last fall, a generous donor who attended our gala for the first time, like many of you here tonight, toured our pregnancy center the following week. 
During our time together, I shared stories about the work we were doing and the thousands of lives we've been able to save from abortion since 1981. When I was done, she asked me what I needed. So I gave her a very practical list of needs. Um, my finance person would have been very impressed. And she wasn't interested. She asked again, almost like she was looking to meet a God-sized request. So this time, I responded with, well, there is this building. And this woman looked me in the eye and said, well, can I buy you that building? Now, you all know, for those of you that have been with me for some time, that I am a crier. John has coined them the Medina Tears, and that day was no different. I looked at Joni, and it, with tears streaming down my face, I said, yes. After meeting with my advisory board and board of directors, we all felt like the Lord was blessing this vision. So we moved forward in faith. And as you can imagine, it's not easy to purchase commercial real estate owned by TMC where the abortion provider himself had a say on whether or not we should be his new neighbor. But God. God gave us favor at every turn, every single turn. This isn't in my script, but if you have read CCNRs, um, it's like a whole different language, and I'm sitting here reading papers and papers of contracts saying, I need a lawyer. I need someone who can walk me through this. And wouldn't you know, I get a call from a friend that says, you know, I talked to my friend who's a lawyer over lunch, and I told him that you were trying to purchase a space in TMC, and he wants to meet with you because he was the general counsel for TMC for 20 plus years. Are you kidding me? It gets better. Oh, it gets so much better. Uh, we had real-time prayer intercessors that I was texting constantly. Hey, we have an issue. Hey, pray for this. Pray for my meeting with this lawyer. Um, it looks like they're, you know, taking a little bit longer to approve us being in there. And, and then I find out that someone we had recently hired had an uncle who was the head of the grounds at TMC that says, let me make a call and tell these people to stop dragging their feet. Are you kidding me? His name is Richard, but I call him Uncle Richard now. I'm probably really messing up the people with the screens. It was Good Friday when Joni and I were able to sign the final papers, and believe me, there were a lot of papers to sign. And by mid-April, we were the proud owners of 5240 East Night Drive, Suite 122. I will never forget that day. In May, our team had a special time of praise and worship as our first act of service in the new location. We consecrated the building to the Lord and wrote scriptures and promises God laid on our hearts for clients who would one day walk through our doors. We plan to build these scriptures into the, into the structure as a reminder that the Lord is our strong foundation and with him nothing is impossible. We sing songs of courage on behalf of our clients, knowing that fear is what the enemy uses to drive women to abortion. Soon after the dedication, in a very miraculous-like way, just like everything else, the Lord provided an architect. We gave her a tour of the space, and um, she fell in love with the idea. And I said, well, what do you charge for something like this? And she said, I'm not going to charge you. I've been praying, asking God, how can I use my gifts and talents for the kingdom? More tears. <laughs> And then later in the summer, he provided a contractor who loves the Lord. And when I looked at his website, I thought, there's no way. This guy's like the best of the best. And then my team reminded me, haven't you been praying for the best? We completed demo a few weeks ago and are currently waiting on final permits from the city to complete the project. We have a goal to complete by Christmas. Wouldn't that be just perfect? For those of you who have been following our fundraising efforts, 
you know that we still needed about $175,000 to collect for the remodel space. My nine-year-old daughter, her name is Emily, is a prayer intercessor. And she has been praying for this building project and for funding all summer long. So it's such a delight for me as her mother to be packing lunches two weeks ago when I got an email from a friend that said, I'm going to cover that balance of the building for you. $175,000. If you're a parent, this is a side note. Our kids are on a spiritual journey. And just like Stephanie was saying, we need to tell them stories of how God shows up. And when we ask God, he's, he's so willing to meet our needs. It was an incredible, incredible moment. I met with my friend who happens to be the designer for the space last week to discuss the details that will make this building extra special for all who will visit. It will literally be a safe haven for women on their way into the abortion clinic and for some who have already been there. Our hope is to offer real-time support to women who have taken the first dose of the abortion pill and they're having regrets. This effective process is called abortion pill reversal and can reverse the effects of the abortion pill allowing the pregnancy to continue. Can you imagine? Initial studies show that the abortion pill reversal has a 64 to 68% success rate. And we know that already 500 babies have been born in the US through this life-saving measure. I cannot wait to get in there. I've been reading Ephesians recently, and I was struck by this familiar passage. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. I read that verse over and over, and I couldn't help but think that this might be one of the good works that I was created for. To affirm my hunch, our contractor asked me a few weeks ago when our building was built. Any guesses of the year? 1979, the year that I was born. I'm a middle kid. The Lord has to remind me over and over. <laughs> this is the way that he's been communicating this year, not just in this effort with the building, but in all areas, as you saw, with prevention and restoration. Ladies and gentlemen, God has a plan, and he is working the plan and if we align with his good and perfect will, we will experience mission advancement. I recently heard a pastor say, God's work done God's way will never lack his supply. I believe that with my whole heart. This is what we've been witnessing at Hands of Hope. And I know I'm not alone. Many of us in this room have answered this call to life-saving work that God has prepared in advance for you to do. You are serving alongside us as we minister to broken people. You are sharing your resources with us, and you are dreaming with us. And I know this because I have been blessed to dream with you over coffee, over a meal, during staff meeting, or times of prayer. Together we dream of a community in Tucson where life is sacred a community where there is grace for women and families facing unplanned pregnancy, a community where men and women are healed from their abortion and made whole because of the death and resurrection of Jesus on the cross. Together, God is calling us to save lives and heal hearts for his kingdom purposes. Together, we are pro-life. Life. Life is awesome. Life is crazy, insane, messy, beautiful, scary, hard, fantastic. Life is amazing. That's why we're pro-life. But what does that even mean? Well, to be pro means to be for something. So sure, we're for life. We're for a lot of things. We're for women, for moms, for dads, for families. We're pro-riding bikes, pro 
toes in the sand, pro first day of driving, first day of school, last day of school. We love life because it's life and everyone has a right to life. So when a woman is anticipating a life, what does she need? She needs to know she's not alone. She needs people to celebrate that life, the ups, the downs, the oh he has your eyes and what a stinker moments. She needs people to walk with her through her journey. See, it's all about equipping and empowering and getting the word out that to be pro-life is to be pro-people. So join us, dream with us, reach, embrace, listen, act, love with us because we can't do this alone. Together, we can reframe the narrative. Together, we can help people live. Together, we are pro-life. God is doing something amazing, and he's asking if we want to come. And so that's what I'm asking you tonight. Will you come with us? Will you join us by giving to this kingdom effort? Because I'll tell you what, this team at Hands of Hope, we are all in. We're fully invested. I'm going to invite Oscar to come back up. And can we just give Oscar a round of hand? Because he was more than I imagined. I'm also going to ask our table host at this time to take out your envelope and pass around some giving cards. In it, you'll see that, or on the front, you will see how your investment meets tangible needs. And I want to take this minute to just talk to you about the tax credit opportunities you have. Many of us aren't aware that we can actually redirect our tax dollars and save lives. So if you have specific questions about that, please visit a ministry table out in the foyer. They're at every table. We have these little postcards that tell you how you can support life with your tax dollars. We have an annual budget of about $1.2 million. I love my board because they dream with me. My board member, Jeff Loggs, and said, what are you going to do when the Lord doubles your budget? I love that. We're going to save a lot more lives. That's what we're going to do. We're going to tell a lot more people about the Lord. Doing this kind of ministry takes resources. You heard one of our clients say, I Googled. Google ads are very expensive and very effective. So along with some other tangible needs, you'll see that it costs about $2,600 a month to redirect women considering abortion to our website, which is where women go for help. You'll also see some other costs there. I want us to, I want us to pray before you do this, and I've been spending a lot of time talking to the Lord about treasure. And I know there are a lot of places that you can give. And I know that there are a lot of places that you do give. And I want to thank you for entrusting us with your treasure. We think about that every day. We take that very seriously. If you are already a monthly donor, we want to thank you so much. Having that um, reliable monthly gift helps us do more ministry and not have to worry so much about fundraising. So if you're already doing that, thank you. Would you pray about maybe increasing that gift? And if God is calling you to do something special tonight, I'm praying that you would have the courage to obey. We cannot outgive the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said it like this, and I thought, I want to hang that on my fridge because we're experiencing this as a family right now. It is beyond the realm of possibility that one has the ability to outgive God. Even if I gave the whole of my worth to him, he would find a way to give it back to me more than I gave. Many of us understand this to be true. My husband and I were talking on the way here, and God's math is not our math. 
okay? Um, so I want to pray for us, and then I want you to take some time to fill out this card, and then we're going to close. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the work that you are doing through your people. I thank you for the courage of the men and women who are willing to stand on the front lines for life, for the most vulnerable among us. I pray for continued courage. And I pray for our faithful donors, Lord, that have agreed to partner with you so that together they can be a part of the kingdom work that you're doing. And so, Lord, I just ask that we would listen in and hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So Oscar's going to play this song while we fill out our giving cards, and then I'm going to close this out. I hear some talking, so that might mean we're wrapping up. By no means do you need to be in a rush, but I do want to officially just thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, if you want more training on how to winsomely talk to your friends about life, we live in some, some difficult times, don't we? And talking about this issue can be very challenging. And Stephanie, thank you so much for your winsome words, because really, 
Um, to quote Dr. Martin Luther King, who's also on your website, in order to change hearts and minds, we must first love people and they must know that we love them. And so if you want a resource, you can go to Stephanie's website, Love Unleashes Life, and you can buy her book, which I have highlighted every single page. I'm going to practice at Thanksgiving because that's always an interesting time to share what I do for work. Um, so I'd encourage you also to pick that up. But um, if you are done filling out your envelopes, you can put them back into your big envelope and give them to your table host. Or we have staff located around the room with baskets that you can go ahead and drop that off. Um, again, we are so grateful that you spent a Thursday evening learning about Hands of Hope. Thank you so much. God bless.